Hello, and welcome to Spoon River, Illinois. In a moment, you'll meet a few guests of an establishment known to the locals as The Hill. But I must warn you, these folks, much like the place they call home, are not quite what they seem. Everyone has a story, and these people are dying to tell you theirs. Tales of triumph and failure, joy and sorrow, good and evil, life and death, secrets, sins, scandals. Life in a small town is never dull. Welcome to Spoon River. Where are Elmer, Herman, Bert, Tom, and Charlie, the weak of will, the strong of arm, the clown, the boozer, the fighter? All, all are sleeping on the hill. One passed in a fever, one burned in a mine, one was killed in a brawl, ah, oh, one died in a jail, and one fell from a bridge toiling for children and family. All, all are sleeping, sleeping, sleeping on the hill. Where are Ella, Kate, Mag, Lizzie, and Edith, the tender heart, the simple soul, the loud, the proud, the happy one. All, all are sleeping on the hill. One died in shameful childbirth, one of a thwarted love, one at the hands of a brute in a brothel, one of a broken pride in the search for heart's desire, one after life in far away London and Paris was brought to her little space by Ella and Kate and Mag. All, all are sleeping, sleeping, sleeping on the hill. Where are Uncle Isaac and Aunt Emily and old townie Kincaid and Savine Houghton and Major Walker who had spoke with venerable men of the revolution? All, all are sleeping on the hill. They brought them dead sons from war, and daughters whom life had crushed, their children fatherless crying. All, all are sleeping, sleeping, sleeping on the hill. Where is old Fiddler Jones, who played with life all his 90 years, braving the sleet with bared breast, drinking, riding, thinking neither of wife nor kin, nor gold, nor love, nor heaven. Lo, he babbles of the fish fries of long ago, of the horse races of long ago at Clary's Grove, of what Abe Lincoln said one time at Springfield. We stand about this place, we the memories, and shade our eyes because we dread to read June 17th, 1884, aged 21 years and three days. And all is changed. And we, we the memories, we stand here for ourselves alone, for no eye marks us, or you would know why we are here. Your husband is dead. Your sister lives far away. Your father is bent with age. He has forgotten you. He scarcely leaves the house anymore. No one remembers your exquisite face, your lyric voice, how you sang. Even on the morning you were stricken with piercing sweetness, with thrilling sorrow before the advent of the child that died with you. All is forgotten, save by us, the memories, who are forgotten by the world. All is changed, save the river and the hill. Even they are changed. Only the burning sun and the quiet stars remain the same. 
and we, we the memories. We stand here in awe, our eyes closed with the weariness of tears, in immeasurable weariness. They have chiseled upon my stone these words. His life was gentle, and the elements so mixed in him that life itself might stand up and say to all the world, this was a man. <laughs> Those who know me scoff as they read this empty rhetoric. My epitaph should have been life was not gentle to him, and the elements so mixed in him that he made warfare upon life, in the which he was slain. While I lived, I could not cope with slanderous tongues. Now that I am dead, I must consent to an epitaph graven by a fool. I went up and down the streets, here and there, by day and night, through all hours of the night, caring for the poor who were sick. Do you know why? My wife hated me. My son went to the dogs. And I turned to the people and poured out my love to them. Sweet it was to see the crowds on the lawns the day of my funeral, and hear the murmurs of their love and sorrow. But, oh, dear God, my soul trembled, scarcely able to hold to the railing of the new life, when I saw M. Stanton behind the oak tree at the grave, hiding herself and her grief. I was only eight years old, and before I grew up and knew what it meant, I had no words for it, except that I was frightened and told my mother, and that my father got a pistol and would have killed Charlie, who was a big boy, 15 years old, except for his mother. Nevertheless, the story clung to me, but the man who married me, a widower of 35, was a newcomer and had never heard it, till two years after we were married. Then he considered himself cheated and the village agreed that I was not really a virgin. Well, he deserted me, and I died the following winter. I was just turned 21, and Henry Phipps, the Sunday school superintendent, was giving a speech at Bindle's Opera House. The honor of the flag must be upheld, he said whether it be assailed by a barbarous tribe of Tagalogs or the greatest power in Europe. And we cheered and cheered his speech and the flag he waved as he spoke. And I went to war, in spite of my father, and followed the flag till we saw it raised in a rice field near Manila. And we cheered and cheered it, but there were flies and poisonous things and deadly water and cruel heat and the sickening putrid food and the smell of the trench just out back of the tents where the soldiers went to empty themselves and there were the whores full of syphilis who followed us and beastly acts between ourselves or alone and bullying hatred degradation among us and days of loathing and nights of fear till the hour of the charge through the swamp, following the flag, where I fell with a scream, shot through the guts. And now, in Spoon River, there's a flag over me. A flag! A flag.
Do the boys and girls still go to Seavers for cider after school in late September? Or gather hazelnuts among the thickets on Aaron Hatfield's farm when the frost began? For many times will the laughing girls and boys played I along the road and over the hills when the sun was low and the air was cool, stopping to club the walnut tree standing leafless against the flaming west. Now, the smell of the autumn smoke and the dropping acorns and the echoes about the veils bring dreams of life. They hover over me. They question me. Where are those laughing comrades? How many are with me? How many in the old orchards along the way to Seavers and in the woods that overlook the quiet water? Almost a shell of a woman after the surgeon's knife and nearly a year to creep back into strength. Till the dawn of our wedding decennial found me my seaman self again. We walked through the forest together by a path of soundless moss and turf. But I could not look in your eyes and you could not look in my eyes for such sorrow was ours. The beginning of gray in your hair and I but a shell of myself. And what do we talk of? Sky and water, anything most to hide our thoughts. And then your gift of wild roses set on the table to grace our dinner. Poor heart, how bravely you struggled to imagine and live a remembered rapture. And my spirit drooped as the night came on. You left me alone in my room for a while, as you did when I was a bride, poor heart. And I, I looked in the mirror, and something said, one should be all dead if one is half dead, nor ever mock life, nor ever cheat love. And I did it, looking there in the mirror. Dear, have you ever understood? The earth keeps some vibration going there in your heart. And that is you. And if the people find you can fiddle, why fiddle you must for all your life. What do you see? A harvest of clover or a meadow to walk through to the river? The wind's in the corn. You rub your hands for beeves hereafter ready for market. Or else you hear the rustle of skirts like the girls when dancing at Little Grove. The Cooney Potter, a pillar of dust or Whirling leaves meant ruinous drought. It looked to me like redhead Sammy stepping it off to Turler. How could I till my 40 acres, not to speak of getting more, with a medley of horns and bassoons and piccolos stirred in my brain by crows and robins and the creak of a windmill? Only these? And I never started to plow in my life that someone did not stop on the road and take me away to a picnic or a dance. Well, I ended up with my 40 acres. I ended up with a broken fiddle and a broken laugh and a thousand memories and not a single regret. Have you seen walking through the village a man with downcast eyes and haggard face? That is my husband, who by secret cruelty, never to be told, robbed me of my youth and my beauty, till at last, wrinkled and with yellow teeth and broken pride and shameful humility, 
I sank into the grave. But what think you gnaws at my husband's heart? The face of what I was, the face of what he made me. These are the things that are driving him to the place where I lie. Therefore, in death, I am avenged. Your red blossoms and the green leaves are drooping, beautiful geranium. But you do not ask for water. You cannot speak. You do not need to speak. Everyone knows you are dying of thirst, yet they do not bring you water. They pass on, saying the geranium wants water. And I, who had happiness to share and longed to share your happiness, I who loved you, Spoon River, and craved your love, Withered before your eyes, Spoon River, thirsting, thirsting, voiceless from chasteness of soul to ask you for love. You who knew and saw me perish before you, just like this geranium, someone is planted over me and left to die. I leaned against the mantel, sick, sick, weak from the noonday heat, thinking of my failures, and looking into the abysm. A church bell sounded mournfully far away. I heard the cry of a baby and the coughing of John Yarnell, bedridden, feverish, Feverish, dying. Then there was the violent voice of my wife. Watch out, the potatoes are burning. I smelled them. Then there was irresistible disgust. I pulled the trigger. Blackness. Light. Unspeakable regret, fumbling for the world again. Too, too late. Thus I came here with lungs for breathing. One cannot breathe here with lungs, though one must breathe. What use is it to rid oneself of the world when no soul may ever escape the eternal destiny? of life. She loved me. Oh, how she loved me. I never had a chance to escape from the day she first saw me. But then, after we were married, I thought she might prove her mortality and let me out. Or she might divorce me. A few die, none resign. Then I ran away and took a year on a lark, but she never complained. She said all would be good that I would return, and I did return. I told her that while taking a row on a boat, I was captured near Van Buren Street by pirates on Lake Michigan. And they kept in chains, so I could not ride her. She cried and kissed me and said it was cruel, outrageous, inhuman. I then concluded our marriage was a divine dispensation and could not be dissolved except by death. I was right. Ye aspiring ones, listen to the story of the unknown who lies here with no stone to mark the place. As a boy, reckless and wanton, wandering with gun in hand through the forest near the mansion of Aaron Hatfield, I shot a hawk perched on the top of a dead tree. 
He fell with a guttural cry at my feet, his wing broken. Then I put him in a cage, where he lived many days, cawing angrily at me when I offered him food. Daily, I searched the realms of Hades for the soul of the hawk, that I may offer him the friendship of one whom life wounded and caged. I was the milliner. <laughs> Talked about and lied about. Mother of Dora, whose strange disappearance was charged to her rearing. <laughs> My eye, quick to beauty, saw much besides ribbons and buckles and feathers and leghorns and felts to, to set off sweet faces, and dark hair and gold. Mm -hmm. One thing I will tell you, and one thing I will ask. The stealers of husbands wear powders and trinkets and uh, fashionable hats. Wives, wear them yourselves. Hats may make divorces, they prevent them too. Now, let me ask you. If all the children that were born in Spoon River had been raised by the county somewhere on a farm, and all the mothers and fathers had been given their freedom to live and enjoy, change mates if they wished, would you think Spoon River had been any the worse? They laughed at me as Professor Moon, a boy in Spoon River, born with the thirst of knowing about the stars. They jeered when I spoke of the lunar mountains, of the thrilling heat and cold, of Eben Valleys by Silver Peaks, of Spica quadrillions of miles away, and of the littleness of man. But now that my grave is to be honored, friends, let it not be because I taught the lore of the stars at Knox College, but rather for this, that through the stars I preached the greatness of man, who is nonetheless a part of the scheme of things for the distance of Spica or the spiral nebulae, and nonetheless a part of the question of what the drama means. I was not beloved of the villagers, but all because I spoke my mind and met those who transgressed against me with plain remonstrance, hiding no nurturing, no secret greets, no grudges. It was the act of the spotten boy that was greatly praised, who hid the wolf under his cloak, letting it devour him uncomplainingly. I think it is braver to snatch the wolf forth and fight him openly in the street amid the dust and howls of pain. The tongue may be an unruly member, but silence poisons the soul. Berate me who will. I am content. I would have been as great as George Eliot, but for an untoward fate. For look at the photograph of me made by Pennewitt, chin resting on hands, deep-set eyes, gray too and far searching. But it was the old, old problem. Should it be celibacy, matrimony, 
or unchastity. Then John Fuller, the rich druggist, wooed me, luring me with the promise of leisure for my novel. And I married him, giving birth to eight children and had no time to write. It was all over with me anyway when I ran the needle in my hand while washing the baby's things and died from lockjaw, an ironical death. Hear me, ambitious souls. Sex is the curse of life. A chaplain in the army, a chaplain in the prisons, an exhorter of Spoon River, drunk with divinity, Spoon River, yet bringing poor Eliza Johnson to shame, and myself to scorn and wretchedness. But why will you never see that the love of women, and even the love of wine, are the stimulants by which the soul, hungering for divinity, reaches the ecstatic vision and sees the celestial outposts? Only after many trials for strength, only when all stimulants fail, does the aspiring soul, by its own sheer power, find the divine by resting upon itself. If, if you in the village think my work was a good one, shutting down bars, stopping all, playing the cards, calling old Daisy Fraser in front of Judge Arnett, then why do you let Dora, the milliner's daughter, and the worthless son of Benjamin Pantier, nightly make my grave their unholy pillow? <laughs> I was a peasant girl, born in Germany. Blue-eyed, rosy, happy, and strong. And the first place I worked was at Thomas Green's. On a summer's day, when she was away, he stole into the kitchen and took me right in his arms and kissed me on my throat. I, turning my head, then neither of us seemed to know what happened. And I cried for what would become of me. And cried and cried as my secret began to show. One day Mrs. Green said to me she understood and would make no trouble for me. And being childless would adopt it. He had given her a farm to be still. So she hid out in the house and sent out rumors as if it were going to happen to her. It all went well, and the child was born. They were so kind to me. Later I married Gus Wertman, and years passed. But at the political rallies, when the sitters by thought I was crying over the eloquence of Hamilton Green. That was not it. No, I wanted to say, that's my son. That's my son. <laughs> Maurice, weep not. I am not here under this pine tree. The balmy air of spring whispers through the sweet grass. The stars sparkle. The whippoorwill calls. 
but thou grievest, while my soul lies rapturous in the blessed nirvana of eternal light. Go to the good heart that is my husband, who broods upon what he calls our guilty love. Tell him that my love for you, no less than my love for him, wrought out my destiny, that through the flesh I won spirit, and through spirit, peace. There is no marriage in heaven, but there is love. In life, I was the town drunk. When I died, the priest denied my burial in holy ground. The rich redounded to my good fortune, for the Protestants bought this lot and buried my body here. Next to that of banker Nicholas, and of his wife, Priscilla. <laughs> Take note, ye prudent and pious souls, the cross currents in life which brought honor to the dead who lived in shame. I was 16 and I had the most terrible dreams, I had specks before my eyes and nervous weakness, and I couldn't remember the books I read, like Frank Drummer who memorized page after page. And my back was weak, and I worried and worried, and I was embarrassed and stammered my lessons, and when I stood up to recite, I'd forget everything that I had studied. Well, I saw Dr. Weiss's advertisement, and there I read everything in print, just as if he had known me, and about the dreams which I couldn't help. So I knew I was marked for an early grave. And I worried, until I had a cough, and then the dreams stopped. And then I slept the sleep without dreams here on the hill by the river. I was a lawyer like Harmon Whitney or Kinsey Keene or Garrison Standard, for I tried the rights of property, although by lamplight, for 30 years in that hard room in the opera house. And I say to you that life is a gambler head and shoulders above us all. No mayor alive can close down the house. And if you lose, you can squeal as you will. You'll not get back your money. He makes the odds hard to conquer. He stacks the cards to catch your weakness and not to meet your strength. And he gives you 70 years to play. For if you cannot win in 70, you cannot win at all. So if you lose, get out of the room. Get out of the room when your time is up. It's mean to sit and fumble the cards and cry about your losses, whining to try and try. Dust of my dust, dust with my dust. Oh, child who died as you entered the world, dead with my death. Not knowing breath, though you tried so hard. With that little heart that beat when you lived with me and stopped when you left me for life. It is well, my child. For you never traveled that long, long way that begins with school days. When little fingers blur under the tears that fall on crooked letters. In the earliest wound when a little mate leaves you alone for another. Or sickness. The face of fear by the bed. The death of a mother or father. Or shame for them. Or poverty. The maiden sorrow of school days ended. An eyeless nature that makes you drink from the cup of love. But you know it's poisoned. To whom would your flowering face have been lifted? 
a botanist, a weakling, cry of what blood be yours, pure or foul, it makes no matter, it is blood that calls to our blood, oh, and your children, what might they be, and to what your sorrow, child, child, Death is better than life. Seeds in a dry pod. Tick, tick, tick. Tick, tick, tick. Like mites in a quarrel. Faint iambics that the full breeze wakens. But the pine tree makes a symphony thereof. Triolets, villanelles, rondelles, rondos, ballads by the score with the same old thought. The snows and the roses of yesterday are vanished. And what is love but a rose that fades? Life all around me here in the village. Tragedy. Comedy, valor and truth, courage, constancy, heroism, failure, all in the loom and oh, what patterns, woodlands, meadows, streams and rivers, blind to all of it, all my life long. Triolets, villanelles, rondelles, Rondos, seeds in a dry pod. Tick, tick, tick. Tick, tick, tick. What little iambics while Homer and Whitman roared in the pines. Suppose it is nothing but the hive, that there are drones and workers and queens and nothing but storing honey, material things, as well as culture and wisdom. For the next generation, this generation never live in, except as it swarms in the sunlight of youth, strengthening its wings on what has been gathered and tasting on the way to the hive from the clover field, the delicate spoil. Suppose all this and suppose the truth, that the nature of man is greater than nature's need in the hive, and you must bear the burden of life, as well as the urge from your spirit's excess. Well, I say, live it out like a god. Sure, of mortal life, though you are in doubt, is the way to live it. And if that doesn't make God proud of you, then God is nothing but gravitation, or sleep is the golden goal. I went to the dances at Chandlerville and played snap out at Winchester. One time we changed partners, driving home at midnight in the middle of June. And then I found Davis. We were married and lived together for 70 years, enjoying, working, raising the 12 children, eight of whom we lost ere I reached the age of 60. I spun, I wove, I kept the house, I nursed the sick and I made the garden, and for holidays rambled over the fields where sang the larks. And by Spoon River, gathering many a shell and many a flower and medicinal weed, shouting to the wooded hills, singing to the green valleys. At 96, I had lived enough and passed to a sweet repose. What is this I hear of? Sorrow and weariness, anger, discontent, and drooping hopes. Degenerate sons and daughters, life is too strong for you. It takes life to love life.
time moves as it will The never standing Wonders never cease. Wonders.